Anything going on over here? No. What about over in mid bay? Well, replenishing metagel is always a good idea. Ah, right, Dr. Chakwas. Yes, Commander? Is there something you need? Oh, I guess he would want to inquire about uh, Caden Lenko. I remember Dr. Chakwas explaining his, con uh, his condition. How well do you know the lieutenant? I'd never worked with him before this mission. But he has an impressive service record, over a dozen special commendations. Tends to keep to himself, though. Maybe because of the headaches. It's not easy being an L2. I think she explained that to him. Maybe get to know Dr. Chakwas a bit better. How did you end up serving on an Alliance ship? I enlisted right out of med school. Earth always seemed boring to me. Too safe. Too secure. I figured the colonies were teeming with exotic adventure. I wanted to travel the stars, tending the wounds of tough soldiers with piercing eyes and sensitive souls. <laughs> Turns out military life isn't quite as romantic as I'd imagined. But humanity needs the Alliance if we want to keep expanding through the Traverse, and the Alliance always needs good doctors. So I stayed on to do my part. Hmm. Huh. You want to know whether she has any regrets? Ever think you made the wrong choice? Sometimes I think about opening a private practice back on Earth. Or maybe taking a position at one of the new med centers out in the colonies. But there's something special about working on soldiers. If I left the Alliance now, I'd feel like I was abandoning them. Hmm. I should go. Goodbye, Commander. Alright, that's just a storage area. Nothing important here. And that we're commanding this ship probably would make a good deal of sense if we got to know it very intimately. There's a Linko. Anything you need, Commander? Hmm. You'd want a status report from Alenko? What's your opinion on the last mission? I don't see how we could have done things any better. At least not without getting to Eden Prime sooner. And we were on the scene faster than any other Alliance ship could have been. Hmm. And perhaps some more personal input. Just trying to get a sense of where the crew's at. Thoughts? I've wasted enough of your time for now, Commander. We'll have time for personal debriefings later. Fair enough. We'll talk another time, Lieutenant. Commander? Arthur likes, uh, Alenko's professionalism. And that appears to be a door. That is closed. Well, there doesn't appear as if there's anything else to do up here. Let's see where the elevator can take us. Tally, she's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. And Arthur would wonder why that's a problem. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. Hmm. Yeah, she does seem to be competent. I figured she'd be a real asset to the team. You've got an eye for talent, Commander. But I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Hmm. Yeah, he would want to know about, uh, the Normandy's capabilities, starting with the stealth systems. Fill me in on the IES stealth systems. How does it work, exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up. Unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself, with no emissions to give away our location. 
Eventually, the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running, and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. Does that mean the ship is actually invisible, or that it just can't be picked up by sensors? There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Hmm, oh, so uh, FTL speeds will probably give the ship away then. Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up the FTL, blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. Hmm. I think technology like that would be standard, but I guess it's new. Alright. Asking about other capabilities the Normandy has? I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on. Probably the fastest vessel ever designed. And she's the only one using the new Tantalus drive core. Hmm, what's this about the drive core? What's so special about the Tantalus drive core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Hmm. And I guess, uh, wanting to know a bit about Adams himself. Where else have you served, Adams? If you name a class of Alliance ship, I've probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo. Only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. Hmm. I guess that's it, then. Thank Adams for his information. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. And then we would want to speak with the, uh, apparently very bright Talizora. And it's probably something you should not stare directly at. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive core like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. Well, it would seem pretty clear that the Normandy is a special ship. And that, uh, <laughs> Arthur is <laughs> pretty lucky to have been issued it. The Normandy's a prototype. Cutting-edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. Oh, so, uh, he would want to inquire about that and why she's so into ships. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Geth. Alright, Arthur with uh, his knowledge of history would know that was practically 300 years ago, apparently. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. Hmm. Well, he would want to know about these pilgrimages, considering that he doesn't know that much about Quarian culture. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. 
If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Hmm. Huh. And uh, he'd want to know just how often these gifts are accepted and what's considered the standard. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? Uh, that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. Hmm. Oh, hmm. He'd want to change topics at this point. I want to talk about something else. Like what? Like about the quarries themselves. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million quarries in the flotilla and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. Hmm, you want to know what kinds? What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. And what would this Conclave be, he'd wonder? That's your government. The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. Oh, so there are elements of democracy. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials. In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. Hmm. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. Hmm. It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. Hmm. It's not that many, considering the amount of time. And finally, he'd want to know what she knows about the Geth. I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Oh, he'd want to know about it. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. And... Wouldn't that be illegal? Or maybe the migrant fleet has different conceptions of their own law, as it were. How come the Council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. And what would this network be? So. 
The Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in the group, the smarter they are. Oh, kind of a similar concept to a hive mind as seen in insects. So there's some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. Hmm. But when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. No, oh, I think that he would understand that. What he would be curious about, or why the Geth became hostile towards the Quarians. What made them rebel? As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. And, well, he could definitely understand why people would be nervous about that. Machines becoming sentient. You want to know what happened next? What did you do? It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. Hmm. How would Arthur respond to that? <laughs> I mean, deactivating them. I mean, they are just machines, but uh, if they have sentience, would they really be considered a, a life form? He wouldn't be accusatory. But, uh... He would surmise that uh, the Geth kind of acted in self-defense, as it were. So that's definitely how it appears. You can't blame them for fighting for their survival. We had no other choice. The Geth were already on the verge of revolution. By acting quickly, we had a chance to end the war before it began. The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Now, we drift through space, exiled, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. Let's see, is there anything else he can ask about? Now, would he want to declare an opinion? He wouldn't say... It served them right. But, uh... Would he want to reiterate that the Geth were defending themselves? I think that he would be more confident in doing. He doesn't want to be antagonistic towards Tali. It's hard to feel sorry for you. Your ancestors tried to wipe out another species. We made a mistake when we created the Geth in the first place. But we did not make a mistake when we went to war against them. If we had not acted, they would have wiped us out. They're a synthetic life form. They have no use for organics. None. Why do you think they cut themselves off from the rest of the galaxy? Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them? Hmm. Well, he wouldn't acquiesce to this. And he wouldn't apologize. So I think he would uh, be inclined to call out an exception on this. Because if you think about it, why aren't they trying to get along with any organic being? Well, it doesn't seem like any organic being is trying to get along with them. They didn't kill Saren. What does that tell you? The Geth are not innocent victims in all this. They're the enemy. They want to destroy us. Not just the Quarians. All organic life. That's why they've joined up with Saren. And that's why we have to stop him. Alright, well, 
Well, she's obviously getting very passionate about this. And, uh, Arthur, for all of his own motivation, knows that when people tend to get very emotional when it comes to political or, or even philosophical discussions like this, that, uh, it just generally becomes an entrenchment with people just stating what they believe and no one really sharing any meaningful thoughts. Just postulating back and forth, so he would, uh, want to stop the conversation there. I should go. See you later. Oh. Apparently we leveled up just by talking to people. Hmm. Well, he's already as charming as he could be. He's already the best soldier that he knows how to be right now. I suppose he could get... Well, he could work on his other abilities. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, we also have fitness now. I think actually that might be a good thing to work on, uh, because it would allow him to get immunity, which increases damage protection. Alright, so we'll start working on that now. That seems reasonable. Okay. I guess we should talk to uh, all the other crewmen down here. Hey, Commander. Looking for some extra supplies before you head out? What have you got? Whatever you want. Armor, weapons, mods. It's not standard Alliance issue, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Well, as long as you don't mind paying for it. Pardon? Why should I pay you for my weapons and armor? My stuff doesn't come from the Alliance. I have to purchase it myself, and it's not cheap. Hell, the licenses alone have set me back more than I'd like. But no licenses, no goods. Without the goods, I'm out of a job. And... is this legal? What are licenses? Why do you need them? Manufacturers sell licenses. Each license allows me to buy and sell a certain brand of products. I already have several basic ones, but you'll need to buy more if you want me to bring in different brands. Many of the best licenses are hard to get, but they're well worth the cost if you can find them. And what are the different manufacturers? What do the different manufacturers offer? There are too many for me to keep track of, but each license will explain what it's good for. Hmm. And what about the prospect of new items? He'd want to know about that. How often will you get new items? Well, that depends on how many licenses you've purchased. But I'll rotate items on a regular basis regardless. And any time we land someplace with a big enough port, I'll buy, sell, and trade whatever I can. Check back often. I need to move items quickly, so only the most basic items will be stocked consistently. Hmm. Let's see what you've got. You bet, Commander. Alright, he's got various kinds of armor, weapons, a metagel upgrade. Oh yeah, definitely. Getting one of these is a good decision. And more grenades. Also a good decision. Everything else is just weapons and armor. Do you have anything in... Oh. Everything else is... Well, more than we can really afford right now. What about the armor? Huh, same thing. Apparently things are quite expensive around here. Is there anything we can sell that we really don't need anymore? Not really. Should probably keep that equipment. Well, it's good to know anyway. Well, let's talk to this uh, new crewman, Garrus, from CSEC. Thanks for bringing me on board, Commander. I knew working with the Spectre would be better than life at CSEC. 